Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Cometh the hour, cometh the man. Um, when we came off stage at the O2 Indigo last night and saw the Good Evening Britain programme unfolding on television in a bar where the, where the sound was off, I couldn't quite believe the lineup of people. Nick Ferrari, when I first met him many, many years ago, he probably doesn't even remember, um, it, it cracked a joke that I have remembered, believe it or not, ever since. It's the only joke he's ever cracked that I've ever remembered ever since. But we were doing one of those late night TV debate shows and... Um, and I hadn't met him before, I was, I, was, I was presenting it and went to meet all the guests. And Nick, who I didn't know very well, said to me, crikey, it's like the bar in Star Wars in here, because he was talking about the dizzying array of individuals that had been booked to appear on this programme. And that was the first phrase that came into my head when I saw Pamela Anderson, James Cleverly, um, Jeremy Corbyn and Danny Dyer on the screen. If, if you missed it, it doesn't matter. We'll, we'll, we'll focus just on this one clip that has truly gone mega viral. And, and it's not hard to see why. You know, increasingly, I try to find, when we turn our attention to Brexit-related topics, I try to find things that we can at least sort of have a broad agreement on, however um, uh, entrenched we may be in our different positions. But it's increasingly difficult to do because the... Um, because uh, well, the truth has been debased now. The, 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 absolutely everything is up um, and swirling around the plug hole. Uh, still, the fibs persist. But that, I think Suella Braverman on Question Time last night claiming there hadn't been any negative impact. For, I mean, it just it is now. It's like Donald Trump, isn't it? You just say it. And, and it becomes true. Alternative fact. Uh, if you think that's an exaggeration, you should know it was a reported yesterday that North Korea is building again at, at one of its key nuclear sites. But it doesn't matter because he has got Kim Jong-un to give up his nuclear weapons. Yeah, but he's actually building more at his plutonium. And yeah, it doesn't matter because you see what I mean? It, this, is, this is the Orwellian stuff that we're in. But I still occasionally think we might have accidentally stumbled on something that could be broadly described as... Representative of most of us, and then I just had a little tickle on Twitter before I came on air this morning, and, and there are some people already who are cross at the suggestion that Danny Dyer spoke last night for the nation. Um, John Rental, uh, a, a superb political commentator for the Independent and uh, visiting professor at King's College London, puts it most um, most pithily, I think, where he just he, he just points a, a finger of of derision really at the idea of Danny Dyer, an actor, getting so much plaudits for blaming Cameron for a decision taken by the country. What is the matter with people, he asks. Danny Dyer, an actor, blames David Cameron for a decision of the British people, and he's a hero. Now, I'm not sure John's quite got it right, because I'm pretty sure Danny Dyer, quite how I know this, I don't know, I was on the tube home from... Uh, the O2 last night, and, and I was so enmeshed in, in the story. It's quite it's annoying when you've hosted something, and <laughs> something that happened on telly shortly after you came on stage. It's just the only thing that you can find on social media. We had we had people thrown out and everything. I thought we'd have been the uh, the big story of the night, but it was Danny Dyer, sadly. Um, and, and, and the point seemed to me to be, I'm pretty sure he voted leave. That was the, the nugget I was going to share. I th I'm pretty sure he voted leave because of that... Um, just that real dissatisfaction with, with politicians in general, you know, the real politicians, the ones that actually have to do stuff and make decisions rather than the pretend ones that can sit at the back of the class throwing rotten tomatoes at teacher. And, and it's a frustration that I do understand. In fact, of all the reasons for voting for Brexit, that's the one I find most compelling. I'm, I'm sort of losing patience with some of the 19th century exceptionalists uh, who seem to think that we can recreate an economic supremacy that, that hinged more or less entirely upon uh, conquering countries and nicking all their stuff and enslaving their populations at various times in history. So the, the only argument now for me that really still works was I voted for Brexit because I knew it was just going to really, really annoy the people in charge. And that, that actually works. And I think that was where Danny Dyer was coming from. Um, eight minutes after ten is the time. This is the political analysis which has captured the mood of the nation in a way that people like me who do it for a living can only dream of. Who knows about Brexit? Yeah, quite. Uh, no one's got...
clue what Brexit is, yeah? You watch Question Time, it's comedy. Were you no clearer when Jeremy Corbyn is No, I ain't got a clue. No one knows what it is. It's like this mad riddle that no one knows what it is, right? So what's happened to that... David Cameron, oh. who called it on. Let's be fair. Oh. I think you're referring no, to no, a former prime no, minister. No. Yeah, but why the heck comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he has no regrets. Where's, where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters up. Yeah. Where is the geezer? I think he should be held accountable. for it. I think, I think he should be held you know, accountable. It's, it. it's a valid point. A lot of people do feel... <laughs> The, the it's that one at the end. I'm sorry, my inner schoolboy is giggling like an absolute loon this morning. It's the one at the end that was, I, I would say it was worthy of Geoffrey Chaucer in its profane, um, apposite brevity. A, a, a moment of absolute televisual beauty. Way after the watershed, so that, and, and we've bleeped it, so, you know, save me a, your hand-wringing faux outrage. But just unbelievable scenes on the television screen. Susanna Reid's face... I, the, the, the grimace that Susanna Reid has affected at the use of the first um, epithet is a thing of, of absolute beauty. It's just unbelievable. But I think he made a lot of sense. I harbour an astonishing antipathy towards David Cameron um, for the very simple reason that I, I think he just played fast and loose with national security in order to settle a psychodrama that began on the playing fields of Eton. It was all about rivalry between him and Boris Johnson. It was all about Boris Johnson's constant agitating for the big job, David Cameron's desire to see it go to George Osborne, the knowledge that if he could harness the Eurosceptic wing of the party, then he became a very potent foe. This is all my analysis. This is opinion. Um, the uh, analysis being sort of, I think, on the money, where David Cameron was just trying to force Boris Johnson's hand. So if you give the Eurosceptic wing of the Conservative Party, the referendum that they've already, um, that they've always dreamed of, and then they lose. I think that was always the presumption. Everything was was predicated upon them losing, but they won. And at that point, um, it became clear that nobody had made any plans at all for what would happen in the event of a no vote. David Cameron, having been adjudged to be a liar and a fraud by the will of the people, understandably, but I suspect shamefully, walked away. I don't think he would have been entrusted with, with, with steering the country towards Brexit. And we, on this programme, of course, have spent the last two years um, examining what... Danny Dyer just described as an absolute riddle. So they still won't quite admit it on, on the Leave side of the argument. They still won't quite admit that they had absolutely no clue what they were actually voting for. That's why they need words like sovereignty and issues like passports um, and nonsense about fish. Because that, that, that is, they're like fig leaves. They're, they're camouflage that allow you to hide your abject ignorance. Uh, the idea that you voted without really knowing what you were voting for is utterly, utterly forgivable. The idea that you spent a lot of time and money persuading people to vote for something without having any idea what it would turn out to be, that is shameful. And onwards from that, the idea that you would offer us a vote on something that we had such astonishing ignorance of, such at unbelievable levels of misunderstanding, and, I, and I'm speaking of myself now, unbelievable levels of ignorance, absolutely no idea how important that vote was, never heard of a just-in-time supply chain, not even aware of Article 2 of the Citizens' Charter. The crash course that we have been on together on this programme is, is hopefully going to be unparalleled in British political history. But it was David Cameron's job as the leader of the Remain campaign to make us aware of all this stuff before the vote was actually cast and none of us knew any of it. I, I, I don't know a great deal about Danny Dyer. I saw him on Who Do You Think You Are? He turned out to be a direct descendant of Edward II, was it? Someone. I mean, it was in a moment of televisual magic. He's now responsible, in my opinion, for, for, for probably the two most magical moments of television, apart, of course, from my much-missed um, ITV daytime chat show O'Brien. Apart from that, these are the two most magical moments of television from the last ten years. If you leave sport out of it, um, I, I don't think there's even much competition. Danny Dyer finding out he was a direct descendant of an English king. And Danny Dyer last night absolutely nailing David Cameron. He's quite good in EastEnders as well. But I'm, I'm going to play it once more, and then we're going to have a look at why, and hardly ever do this, but I, I, even I'm allowed a day off occasionally. How outraged are, how cross are you with David Cameron? And I think this might be a way of uniting Leave and Remain, although the only Leavers who are going to admit to being cross with David Cameron are the ones who've 
acknowledged and are still uh, being honest and aren't in denial and delusion about the fact that they had no idea what was on the table when they actually cast their vote. I think I think the Remain side are a bit insulated from that accusation because they voted for the status quo. They voted for retaining pretty much what was in place. So it wasn't hard to point at it and say what the future would look like. But the Leave side, as has become abundantly clear subsequently, um, almost every vote cast to leave the European Union was cast for different reasons. Only 22% of people who voted Leave thought that leaving the single market was a possibility let alone a certainty, because now they all claim it was a certainty. So here is Danny Dyer, political sage de nos jours, on former Prime Minister David Cameron. Who knows about Brexit? Yeah, of course. Uh, no one's got a f clue what Brexit is, yeah? You watch Question Time, it's comedy. Well, you know clearer when Jeremy Corbyn... No, is I ain't got a clue. No one knows what it is. It's like this mad riddle that no one knows what it is, right? So what's happened to that... David Cameron, who pulled it off. Let's be fair. Oh, I think what? we're referring no, no. to the former Prime Minister. No, no. Yeah, but why the heck comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Yeah. Yeah. He, he has no regrets. Where's he, where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters up. Yeah. Where is the geezer? I think he should be held account for it. He you know should be held you know account it's for a, it. It's a valid point. A lot of people do feel. Oh, sure. the, 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 all right, phone lines are open. 03456060973. Did Danny Dyer speak for you? OK. What is the nerve he's touched there? I, I'd like you to articulate it. He didn't do a bad job at all I mean, up there in Nice with his trotters up. Where is the geezer? But what has he actually articulated? Because as, a, as someone who thinks we've made a terrible, terrible decision by voting to leave the European Union, I, I, I can only go halfway on that. People who voted to leave, who now feel furious with David Cameron, Danny Dyer seemed also to speak for them. So articulate the nerve, describe the nerve that this magnificent man touched last night. That's, that's what I really want. I hope this works. I just want to try and nail it. And also, on a, on a much more simple level, so if you've never phoned me before, um, uh, you've been waiting for an opportunity, I can't really see this uh, being anything other than, than a, a veritable cornucopia of peace and harmony. So it'll be a lovely morning to break your duck. The, the question then becomes, does Danny Dyer speak for you? He's in Nice with his trotters up. 0345 6060 If not, of course, you're, you're equally welcome. But I just, I just wonder how broad a church of Brexit opinion Danny Dyer managed to unite by focusing his ire and his disgust exclusively on the man who called the referendum. It could potentially be the first stage to a nationwide recognition that the whole thing is a disaster. Because if you start by acknowledging that the vote itself should never have been called, you take a few steps closer to concluding that the result shouldn't necessarily be um, followed without another crack of the whip, without another exercise of democracy. 10.16 is the time. And uh, we're curiously mel melding popular culture and politics. Um, Dom Jolly, the TV presenter, knows a bit about magical TV moments. He's just tweeted to say, I never thought I'd say this at Mr James O'B, but my two favourite Brits at the moment are Danny Dyer with a Y and Danny Dyer with an I. Um, is she on Love Island? Is that... Can someone just... Yes. Okay, so that's his daughter, is it? That's, that's like the that's so that's the geezer version of Nigel Lawson calling his daughter Nigella, isn't it? So Danny Danny with a Y die calls his daughter Danny with an I. Uh, Don Jolly adds he nailed Cameron. She is the poster girl for decency. What on earth has happened? Um, is he really? Uh, I mean, has he nailed Brexit? Is Danny Dyer the Jesus of post-Brexit British politics? Did he speak for you? If he didn't speak for you, what do you think he was articulating? And when he says that Brexit is a complete riddle, suggests that nobody knows what's going on, describes Question Time as a, as a comedy programme, he's absolutely right about that. Um, why would anyone deny it? Uh, the only people who are going to deny it are the people who are still waiting for their unicorn, right? I don't know, we'll find out. Barry's in Newport. Barry, what would you like to say? Uh, morning, James, how are you? Very well, Barry, what's on your mind? I think Danny Dyer really touched the nerve and, and highlighted something that um, has almost been you know, swept aside because of the shambles that we've seen with the Theresa May government and uh, Boris Johnson 
and the unicorns. We've not dwelt enough, I don't think, on the absolute shambolic decision-making of David Cameron. Well, you uh, can't. You see, I, I wonder whether it's because you can't say that the referendum was an absolute disaster without everybody thinking, probably rightly, that you're also describing the result as a disaster. Do you see? I think that, that, that side of the debate has been shut down by the unicornists very successfully and by the Brexit means Brexit banality. But the level of debate was was wretched yes. in the in the referendum campaign. I think we can agree on that, and that just speaks to the fact, in my opinion, um, David Cameron was was playing fast and loose with our future, with our children's future, all on the altar of the right wing nutters of the Conservative Party. I mean, he took a huge he, he took a huge gamble. He walked into a casino. He played blackjack. He doubled down on sixteen, and he pulled out a king um, and, and bust. And that that was his uh, that was the gamble. Comple and, that, and that was it. It was all or nothing. It was lost. It was it, it, it was <laughs> over. So what what do you think that Dyer is articulating then? The just the because the, I, I mean look, my colours are fairly firmly nailed to, to to one mast on this, but I don't think that necessarily informs answers to this question of what he's articulating. Even if you knew it was going to unravel like this, it 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 doesn't ex disqualify you from saying perhaps what he was articulating was utter utter outrage and incomprehension of how it could be unravelling so badly, of how, of how there could be so little substantive progress, or how nobody knows what it's actually going to look like, yeah. which, unless you listen to this programme, probably describes the entire nation. And I think it's that last point you made it, it is, is the piece that I would focus on, the way you described it as a riddle. We are how many months down the road now post-referendum and how close are we you, you know, the supposed deal having to be in place, and it's still a riddle. And it's not, um, you know, this isn't a Miss Marple. You know, th this is this is the future of our country. You know, that we're that we're dealing with. This is the economic relationship we have with our biggest trading partner. This is how um, industry can collaborate across Europe. How our, our but the, but, the, but, but the, I'm, I'll, I'm, I'm, I'll take that on another day. We're focusing on on what he articulated last night, and and, 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 and I, I think I think I think you're onto it. it but, but what people can't admit yet is that they made a mistake, so they're going to be outraged with the person that gave them the choice. Uh, yes, but I don't... Um, it's easier to say, sure. I, I can't believe you gave me that choice than it is to say, you gave me a choice and I made the wrong choice. I mean, they're very, very close to each other, but they're not quite the same thing, are they? Yeah, but isn't it saying that you, you gave me that choice and I still don't know what I've chosen? But again, that involves admitting that, that, that they don't have all the answers and they didn't know exactly what they were doing and that Brexit means Brexit means nothing. And, and a lot of people aren't ready to do that yet. I completely understand why. Um, thank you, Barry. Sam's in Egham. Sam, what would you like to say? I just think that David Cameron was utterly irresponsible because he didn't keep control of his own cabinet while he was messing about with the referendum. So Theresa May was in the Home Office, merrily starting all these go-home immigrants vans, mm. and he did nothing about it. You know, he portrayed himself as a nice, cuddly, not nasty party conservative. Hug a hoodie. Yeah, that that type. And, you know, did some reasonable things. I mean, I'm I'm no fan, but did some reasonable things when he was in office. Let let the remain message be it'll be bad for business which I'm sure went down like a lead balloon in the north where... And they'd completely, um, although they're sadly about to find out the accuracy of that, places like Nissan and uh, an Airbus, but the... The, the, the other side of that then becomes the immigration um, yeah. argument because as you quite rightly point out, he couldn't really argue positively for migration, for freedom of movement, because he had presided over a home office that had weaponized yeah. immigration. So, and he knows why um, I mean, he couldn't do it. He could be could... My, my husband is from Greenock, which is yes. like, quite deprived, and there is a massive banner explaining how the EU contributed to the rebuilding of an entire quite shocking council estate there yes and that was the, like you know those things are isolated in places that nobody went to and just seem to be neglected it's another lesson we've learned an astonishing that like, nine out of ten of the most poverty stricken areas in the european union are in the united kingdom and the, but the, the money we send to brussels as it were that then gets sent back is sent back according to need so what a lot of leave voters in the poorest part of the country have done is vote to leave an institution that ensures money is directed according to need and poverty and trust the conservatives in westminster to allocate the diminished amount of money left in a similar way and if you think the conservatives have a history 
of directing their investment and funding towards the most poverty-stricken parts of the country, you probably need your head examining. Um, Sam, thank you. Rob's in Manchester. Danny Dyer, Rob, what, what did he do last night? All right, mate, good morning. Uh, new listeners to this show. Great show, by the way, You're mate. You're very welcome. It gets worse. Uh, We've peaked already. It's downhill all the way from now, Rob. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, basically, well, what I'll say is this. I mean, I'll put my cards on the table for me. I voted leave, right? Yes. But regardless of that... Whatever side you're on, Danny Dyer made me chuckle there, believe me. Mm. I liked it, right? And But he mentioned something there about uh, Brexit being a riddle. He did. Right? And he's, now, what I'm going to say, correct me if I'm wrong on this, mm. if you go to the 17-odd million people who voted to leave, what was in their mind when he put the X in that box that day? To me, it was this. What did he want? Stop mass immigration, protect our borders, implement our own laws. That's what the man on the street had in his head when he voted to leave. He did, right? but, but uh, no. as, a, as a new listener to the programme, you may not be familiar with what I do at this point, which is point right. out that we had um, the full right to restrict what you call mass immigration or, or, or to limit freedom of movement, depending on what vocabulary you prefer. We could quite easily have insisted that anyone moving here from the EU who hadn't found a job after three months or demonstrated the financial wherewithal to support themselves could have been required to leave. The reason that they didn't do that was because um, it would have cost way, 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 way more than it ever would have saved. And people like David Cameron knew that freedom of movement was very good for the British economy, but they couldn't tell the British people that because they were also running a home office that was sending go-home vans out into the street. Ditto controlling our borders. Um, it, it's a meaningless phrase, and I understand why people swallowed it, because it, it plays to the most atavistic of fears. But if, if you've ever gone on holiday abroad w without going through a controlled border, Rob, I'd be very surprised. We just can't overlook that. And finally, when you say we want to make our own laws, what I usually say is, what is the law inflicted upon you by the European Union that you're most looking forward to not having to obey anymore? No, I, I accept all that. Like, well, no, I mean, can, could not, you, will, you, will you have a go at answering it? You don't have to, because no, I don't, I don't I'm think you could... I'm, I'm not a highly political book. I'm just... I'm just no, but you thought you had to obey all the... You voted because you thought you had yeah. to obey all these laws from Brussels, and then when I ask you to name one of them, yeah, you yeah, probably can't, can you? Well, yeah, I, I'm not going to sit here and get shirty with you. You've got the better of me and all that there. All right, I carry understand on. All that. <laughs> but basically, like I said, at the end of the day... Um, where the immigration's involved, for instance, I'll try and come back on that one there. I think we should have need and want immigration. I am not against that whatsoever. I have come across immigrant people. I run a small building company. And to be quite, put me cards on the table, mate, um, the amount of young, white, British, ethnic, put it into a box, people had working to me in comparison to Polish or et cetera like that there. The work ethic on these immigrants puts us, and a lot of the people I've had in the past, in, have I've employed... So it was, the ones, it was the ones you didn't know personally that you had a problem with, the ones you were reading well, no, about. I, I, no, I, I'd never had a problem with any of them. I'm oh. going to mention what N um, Nigel Farage said once, oh. and I think it's fair. He <laughs> said, I don't blame any immigrant for wanting to better their lot at all, right? Um, if this, I was, this was before he started. This was before he started making speeches to the to the neo Nazis in Germany, wasn't it? It was yeah, before I, he I, signed I up with the have, AFD. I've, got, any of that. I, I've yeah. got people in my culture. I'm a British Roman Egyptian. Right? Well, then you know all about I, Holocausts. Yeah. Exactly. I've been to Auschwitz. I've seen where it happened, and I'm against all that, obviously, right? And the immigrants I've met, I've had absolutely no issue of whatsoever. I want the mere mate, right? But what I'm not after the ones that's coming over. The ones you haven't even, met. Yeah, who's yeah. not doing us any harm, I but know. at the end of the day, if, if I go to the cinema... Well, it's the, it's the, the ones cinema. you haven't met you've got a problem with, the ones that well, you've... No, let me yeah. just cut in there for a second, right? Go on, cool. I'll let you speak, so... Thank <laughs> you. And I like you, I like... The I like you, you too, Rob. Right, right, but what I'm saying is this, right? If I go to the cinema to book a film, right? Yes. And the cinema's full, right? Yes. It doesn't mean that cinema doesn't like me or doesn't want me and my family to watch that film. There's no seats, Rob. Right, and the, we're only a small as, as, island, yes. and the country's full. But what I'm going to put in on this? Is no, it's not, because I'm late for the news, and we haven't spoken about Danny Dyer. And, and I, I mean, I appreciate you're a new listener, but I've been round the houses with all of these arguments. Yeah, so you yeah, just yeah, go and look yeah. at the viral clips on the internet, mate, and save us, save us both five minutes. Yeah, in a yeah. sentence, what do you think Danny Dyer nailed last night for someone like you who voted to leave? I'll tell you what you nailed. Whether the people who voted re remain of or leave, the politicians behind it, right? Mm. They've got it in a mad riddle, and they've created a riddle out of something that shouldn't have been a riddle. Do you know what you're going to realise next, mate? Go on. It, it, it could only ever have unfolded like this. 
you, well, you, you could well be right. I am. I uh, no, seriously, keep listening. Years. Keep listening. And I've got to go. It's the news, Rob. It's a lovely debut. I look forward to talking again. But, but I, it pains me to say this. That, that is the first of the scales falling from your eyes. It is a riddle. It was always going to be like this because undeliverable promises were made to people like you. Promises about cinemas suddenly being empty. One of the thin silver linings to the political clouds currently engulfing the nation um, is the discovery of excellent journalism being done away from the better known brands and I'd just refer you to the Business Insider uh, website uk.businessinsider.com um, where a journalist called Adam Payne has been breaking some really really good stories. Um, I, I've just tweeted the latest since I have impeccable contacts in the um, EU camp, in the Barnier camp. I've, I've just retweeted his latest scoop. It, it, it's not pretty reading for Theresa May. It suggests that Michelle Barnier has already rejected the plan that she's hoping to serve up <laughs> to the European Union. And that white paper come July the 9th um, isn't going to be worth the paper that it's printed on. So watch this space. One more clip of Danny, though. I'm not overplaying it. I'm conscious of the fact that, that people will be tuning in just after half past ten and they won't necessarily know what we're talking about, although um, this is uh, one of those clips that has gone all the way around the world and back by, by breakfast this morning. Danny Dyer, the actor, star of EastEnders, um, talking on a, an ITV post-footballing programme. And Jeremy Corbyn sitting on the other side of the desk. I, I, I'll go all in this morning, actually, but that this is what Jeremy Corbyn should have been saying, isn't it? Not Danny Dyer. For, for, for disaffected lefties who are expecting some form of opposition to the government's breakneck dash towards oblivion and self-harm. Surely Jeremy Corbyn on the same programme, looking rather dapper actually, I don't know who his stylist is, looking rather dapper, should have been the one saying this. Instead it fell to Danny Dyer. Who knows about Brexit? Yeah, quite. Uh, no one's got a clue what Brexit is, yeah? You watch Question Time, it's comedy. Were you no clearer when Jeremy Corbyn... No, I ain't got a clue. Politics. No one knows what it is. It's like this mad riddle that no one knows what it is, right? So what's happened to that... David Cameron, who called it off. Let's be fair. Oh, I think you're referring to a former prime minister. Yeah, but why the, how comes he can scuttle off? He called all this on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He, he has no regrets. Where's, yeah. Where is he? He's in Europe, in Nice, with his trotters up. Yeah. Where is the geezer? I think he should be held accountable for it. You know what? Think he should be held you know accountable for it. It's a valid point. A lot of people do feel <laughs> that. The... <laughs> Sorry. Oh, TV gold. And and how come he's... Because he's, he, he's united people behind him who disagree with each other. That, that's the weird thing. I appreciate if you voted leave, you're not ready to join me yet in, in uh, acknowledging publicly you were completely conned by people who made a flipping fortune out of the deliberately engineered fall in the pound. But you are ready to admit that what is happening bears no resemblance whatsoever to what you thought was going to happen. And the reason why perhaps... Um, you get a bit cross with me sometimes, is that I ask you to tell me what you thought was going to happen and you can't. But why, you know, <laughs> it did. Wow. Well, Andrew's in Kingston upon Hull. Kingston, um, Andrew even, what would you like to say? Yes, uh, I've been saying this all the time. There's been a 40 year battle between the right wing of the Conservative Party and Mr. Dyer has actually put his finger on the pulse. I believe the people that surround me, my family, who come from Hull, lived in all, all our lives, and travelled all over the country, I have, yes. basically. And I see the devastation that the concert well, not just the Conservatives, but consecutive governments over... I'm 65 years old. I'm a crippled lorry driver, so all I do is listen to the radio Gosh. and listen to the, you know... So my opinion... I'm a, what you just said, Jeremy Corbyn should have got off his bottom and applauded him. But he's not doing that. And I, I, I am his, one of his. I've never voted Labour in my life, not since Thatcher, because I realised that the whole system is rigged. I couldn't vote for Blair. And all of a sudden, a man pops up and talks about socialism again which is in my heart, which means that we look after our poor, we look after our sick, we look after those that are a misfortune, that are not all bankers, that are not all, you know, the Nigel Farages of this world. I've had a way... I need you, James, to ask some hard questions to Nigel Farage and Mr Hogg if they are... If they are 
comfortable with the amount of Russian money swilling around the leave comp you know, you know what I'm talking about. I do. Oh, no, it's, it's, it's unlikely. It's unlikely I'll get the opportunity to pose those questions. No, I, after. I, I got angry with him, so I didn't ask him. Cause after I, the way I things un unfolded last yeah. time, well, we both had our experiences. Can I steer you back, Andrew? And and, and I understand. Well, you said, do you know one of my dad's first jobs was on the whole Daily Mail? Yes, I know. Yes, I do know that. <laughs> do you? I've got to stop talking and about I my dad mean, all the time. I don't agree with you. No, I don't expect you to, but I want to, I want to learn from you yeah. now. What did Danny Dyer, what, what did he, what did he nail last night that, that resonated what most with you? that, as I've said, it's been a psychodrama from what was in, yes. the, in the metropolitan bubble. People that surround me in the North East have seen how we have been, the last bit of uh, stuff that was ever built here, we've just got a factory, was the Umber Bridge was in the 80s, and that was a white elephant when it was bought. But, but you're still and not was, telling me what Danny Dyer got right. Yeah, it's the fact is that we've been ignored and the fact that people voted to give David Cameron, the Conservatives, and the governments of, of you know, over the years, a kicking. That's what I believe. I voted to remain. Yes. And I, and and seventy percent of the so seven people around me voted against. In Hull. It wasn't for the racists. It wasn't. I mean, yes, there are. It was a howl. It was a howl of frustration, is what you're it describing. Was a howl of frustration. A grandmother that I've known for a long, long time chastised me for voting remain. She said. This government is a disgrace. These governments that we've had, and she was a 90-year-old grandmother. Mm. She voted to remain. Now, Air Ilk built this country. Actually, the backbone of this country, not your Greece mobs and your, and your Lawsons and your... Do you know what I mean? The, I, I do the, know what you mean. I just don't want to interrupt you. people yes. built this country. My grandfather did two world wars, and I have to listen to Mr. Ha-Ha, Lord Ha-Ha, oh, that's who I call him. Yes. Mr. Nigel Fragile. Well, you don't have to listen. I, I, mean, I don't, I don't no, this no. is a commercial organisation. We've all got bills to pay, but it, I, I, I worry have, about your blood pressure, Andrew. I do have to listen to him because if we don't listen to them, we don't know who the actual enemy is. And I believe that he is an enemy of the state. No, it's, it's, it's a massive thing to say, but I actually believe that Nigel Farage and his ilk have sold us out to the Russians. You've only got to look at what Trump's doing now. You've only got to open your eyes and your ears to see what's happening. And I am afraid that my grandfather in his grave now is actually turning in it and thinking, what has this country become? What has this country become? And, uh, and uh, I mean, the way you then typify the, the massive vote for leave in, in Hull would be uh, I, 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 just a, a sort of sense of, of look, finally, they're going to have to listen to my voice, so I'm going to shout from the rooftops, I just don't like the way things are. And the, the, the notion that it involved a complex understanding of what Brexit negotiations might entail was, was clearly nonsense for everyone. V voting remain or leave. Absolutely. The truth is that not many people knew what was... I was a, I was a con continental lorry driver, so I know what borders mean. Yes. I've stood on Calais for a, for a day waiting for them to clear customs. I've been on the borders of Switzerland. But that's all, that was all Project Fear. I mean, this was the clever Ex tactic, wasn't it? Absolutely. All of the, the evidence-based... Uh, prediction or forecast or description Absolutely. became Project Fear. Andrew, it's been Absolutely. a pleasure. It's been a pleasure talking to you, mate. I, I, I've, I've got to crack on because it's very nearly 10:45. Um, we didn't really get that close to the Danny Dyer element of the conversation, but I enjoyed your critique of just about every other aspect of post-war British politics. I really did. I agreed with most of it as well. Although I, I don't know. I mean, the big challenge really is how we. I mean, this is the scary thing. It's an aging population in a low growth economy so all of the rules of of, of baby booming boom baby boom and bust decades are being torn up and thrown out of the window and while like andrew i feel 
uh, nostalgic's not quite the right word, wistful about, about the idea of somehow bringing back industry and prosperity. I don't know what it would look like. Um, I really don't. Sort of tempted to make a list of people who felt that, that some of what this um, uh, astonishingly... Uh, what's the word for when you cut through? Some incisive contribution to the Brexit debate from Danny Dyer. Um, the, the astonishingly disparate groups of people who've been united in feeling that he, in some sense, spoke for them. Leavers, Remainers, in-betweeners, neithers, neithers, people who've changed their mind, people who haven't. It, 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 it's odd to me because of what we do together every day, which is point out how absurd and convoluted and unsolvable it is. How, how, I mean, from the minute Article 50 was triggered, everything that's happened since has been inevitable. Um, but I guess he just put it better than we have. It's because I'm not allowed to swear on the programme. He, he just somehow nailed that sense of disbelief at how chaotic everything is. And everybody who warned before the referendum that it was going to be chaotic uh, either got shot down as part of Project Fear rhetoric or, of course, um, can be blamed sort of for not having done more to address the chaos. And George Osborne, on, I think on this radio station, talking to Ian Dale, so there hadn't been a plan for, for the vote going the way that it went. I, I simultaneously understood and disapproved. I understood because their position would be, it's not our job, you made this mess, you get out of it. And, and, and that's what I thought Theresa May was doing when she hired David Davis and Liam Fox to the, and, and Johnson to the big jobs. I thought she was saying, it's your mess, you fix it. Possibly crossing her fingers and hoping that they might be able to, but most of us knew it was an unfixable mess. Um, Osborne knew that, Cameron knew that. That's why they ran away at the first possible opportunity. But it was their fault, and that's what Danny Dyer has nailed. The, the bit I'm confused by is that continuing delusional denial that involves really, really hating David Cameron for calling the referendum because it's all gone so wrong, which somehow doesn't admit the fact that it's all gone so wrong because of the results not because of the referendum. <laughs> if it had gone the other way, we wouldn't be having this conversation. We'd be um, talking about all the things that Andrew up in Hull, who has touched an awful lot of nerves, and if you'll allow me to say so, Andrew, an awful lot of hearts as well, we'd be talking about all the things that our politicians should be addressing. Uh, and needless to say, the, 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 the momentum crybabies think I've been attacking Jeremy Corbyn this morning by suggesting, with even complimenting him on his clobber, just suggesting that this is the kind of position that somebody uh, in the front line of British politics, ideally the leader of the opposition to the government, should have taken. It shouldn't be left to an actor on television. And just while we're talking about the fact that he's an actor... I can't tell anymore what's parody and what's real trolling. Uh, is anyone suggesting that he was acting? It, have we had that yet from the from the from the unicornists that Danny Dyer was actually acting? Didn't really mean it. He got briefed backstage by I don't know ITV, uh, and he was actually a Ramona plant who was uh, hired for the occasion to just read out lines. Has anyone, I bet they have suggested that. You know, ten fifty two is the time. Catherine is in Lowestoft. Catherine, did he speak for you? Yes, he did. Surprisingly, really? caught me by surprise. Yes. Um, May I just revert very briefly back to Andrew? Of course. He was passionate, and when he said the piece about that we should look after the people, the poor, he made me, like, tear up in yes. my car. I was like, oh, and I could have listened to him for a while, and you were wonderful in allowing him to run with that. He's fabulous. He should be up on a soapbox somewhere. He, he sort of had it. You I, I, so I, 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 I think you should do my holiday cover, actually. I would agree. Sorry. <laughs> Um, your show last night from London was fantastic. I listened to it, but sadly, Danny Dyer has stole your thunder. Yes, I'm I quite watched... happy about that, though. I don't, I don't okay. mind. <laughs> I watched the programme last night. I don't really know who Danny Dyer is one way or the other, and I don't watch Love Island. I'm just not of that age group. But I sat up sharp when he said the T word about David Cameron. I thought he was brilliant. I don't think he was coached. I think he spoke from the heart. He was angry. And the point is, how is a politician allowed to take a country to a precipice let it start tipping over the edge and walk away, brushing the dandruff off his shoulders, going, oh, well. <laughs> Everyone's a poet. Everyone's a poet today. I, I'm not going to defend... we trying to figure it out. Yes. So I, I'm now interested in who Danny Dyer is, purely for the fact that I thought he spoke 
I think he's the British Emmanuel Macron. That's what Danny Dyer is. We've been waiting, finally. The king across the water has arrived. Let me just take you back slightly. I do, good knows. I guess a mark of how bonkers Brexit has made everything, because I'm about to now mount a sincere but, but, but shallow defence of David Cameron. If, if the so-called will of the people and, and you know, the, the, the tombra of the Daily Mail, the, the, the horrible um, attempts to attack the independent judiciary, the sovereignty of parliament, the academic independence of our universities, judges, I mean, you, you name it. In that atmosphere, 52% of the country had called David Cameron a bare-faced liar. I don't see that he had any choice but to walk away, did he? Even though it subsequently emerged that he was um, ineffectively telling the truth. I think he had a choice, and I think that they all had a choice to tell us the truth. And I don't think either Remainers or Brexiteers, any of us really worked our vote from the truth. No, that's now, true. Now is the truth. We were said, we were asked, do you want to be in or out? Of what, exactly? Well, now, there you go. And there it is. And you, you presumably voted Remain. I did. So um, you, you I, knew what you were staying in, but the anger of people who voted to, to get out but aren't yet ready to admit that they had no idea what they were voting for, he somehow managed to give them... A, a sense of being represented, possibly because he didn't go into too much detail. Uh, that's where the T word it becomes such a helpful weapon. And what was hilarious was he said his piece, and then the camera panned, oh, and then out of nowhere he said it again. And that was just poetry. That if actually if anyone who doesn't realise that that's what was happening, I might just allow myself to play it one more time because that final beep. He describes David Cameron. Um, when we were at school, we were told it was, it was a synonym for a pregnant goldfish. That was probably one of those school schoolboy myths. But it, it, if you were of a similar generation to me, then you'll you'll know what I'm saying. It begins with T. So he said it in the in the in the spiel, in the, as Catherine said while he was saying his piece. And then he sat back and he obviously just felt that there was still there's still something stuck in there. I, just, I haven't got it all out yet. And that final one, when Piers Morgan has already sort of sought to move proceedings along a bit and and Dyer's still very much in his own head isn't he he's still he's still very much in his own thoughts and that final one just kind of distills his thinking down to a single spectacular syllable who knows about brexit yeah cool. uh, no one's got a clue what brexit is yeah you watch question time it's comedy well you know clearer when jeremy corbyn no, is I got clue. no one knows what it is it's like this mad riddle that no one knows what it is right so what's happened to that david cameron who called it on let's be fair oh, i think you're referring to a former prime minister yeah but why the comes he can scuttle off he called all this on yeah yeah he, he has no regrets Where's it, where is he he's in europe in nice with his trotters up yeah where is the geezer I think it should be held account for it. You know what? Think it should be held you know account it's for a, it. It's a valid point. A lot of people do feel... No, Dad, just get in. Honestly, I know, I know, I know we shouldn't really praise profanity, but we've bleeped it out and it went out after the watershed. Um, I'd love to meet him, actually. I'd love to interview him. I might get him in. 10.56 is the time. What, why did he cut so, touch so many notes? Catherine, thank you so much. Rob's in Gravesend. What, what do you think? No one's rung in to say they think he's a divot. We, we should probably try... Have we got anyone who thinks he was a divot and bang out? Is that you, Rob? No. Oh, all right. Can, 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 I, can, can, I, can, I don't know how you feel. He summed up the mood of the nation um, it, pretty damn effectively. Um, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, I've been listening to, I've been listening for about an hour, and I, yeah. and I got the link sent to me by a friend uh, when I got out of bed this morning. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that <laughs> there, there, there's no, there's no sugarcoating it. It's, he's talking about the actual lack of accountability. And the, the, the thing is, is that he's, he's absolutely right because this is what, what people are really frustrated by. It. You've got to remember, we live in a system where only two thirds of our democratic legislative process is, is actually democratic, and that's the House of Commons. And the thing is, is that... I don't think he was talking about that, Rob. No, no, he wasn't talking about let's that. Let's try to focus on what he was talking about. What he was talking about. about the lack of accountability. It's a, it's well, I, I heard him say that, so... But you can't... I mean, no, we're not talking about... We're not no, well, let me show you what happens. It. Rob, let me show you what happens. You found him to make a slightly different point. You know, we can, we, when we yeah. talk about the democratic deficit, I'll put you at the front of the queue, but we're talking about a different yeah, double no D worries. today. We're talking about Danny Dyer. And here's what happens if you try to hold David Cameron to account, right? You call him in, you stick him in front of a committee, and you say to him, why on earth did you call this referendum? And he just gives you a long list of all the people who told him to. 
And that's it. Yeah. His, his accountability is complete. It's not his fault. Uh, yeah, but then he's got to, he's got to name, name the advisors, hasn't he? He, don't, he, don't, he, he said it was a disaster to leave. Not. He's done. He's, he's yeah. covered both ways, mate. He said, look, Boris Johnson wanted a referendum. This fellow over here wanted a referendum. The fag packet fascists wanted a referendum. The judge, 1922 judge, committee, judge. the Bruges Group, judge. the Taxpayers Alliance, they all wanted a judge. referendum. The Daily Mail, the Daily yeah. Express, the Daily... I'm not going to stop. I'm judge. on a roll. The Daily Telegraph, the Daily Express, all of them, they all wanted a referendum. So I gave him a flipping referendum. I then yeah. dedicated a year of my life to telling everybody why they should vote to remain. They ignored me. They called me a liar. What am I accountable for? And in this process that you're talking about, he's been induced, he's induced a period of uh, austerity. Yeah, where you're he's doing it again. Cut back services. He's said, no, but the thing is, is that this is the point. This is the point, James. But what are you going to hold him accountable austerity. for? You hold him accountable for his, his, his well, the PP decision-making process. But you can't. Why that's you? ridiculous. Well, you might as well call John Major back to explain why the Cones hotline was such a disaster. He's gone, mate. That ship has sailed. But, mate, we're, we're also we're also talking about an inquiry of nine, of what of events back at 9-11. These, these ships have certainly sailed. But the thing is, is that we'd like to see a process where politicians are actually brought to account for the decisions that they yeah, but actually you, But make. they are. They're at elections. And so, no, you can't. It's not no-one else's. You can't, you can't be held to account once you've left the job. Unless, of course, there's uh, evidence of genuine wrongdoing. But Cameron just made an absolute... Danny Dyer, favourite word of himself. It is coming up to 11 o'clock. I might take a little bit more on this, but we do want to crack on with other stuff as well. We, we, we need people who, who think Danny Dyer is a terrible blemish upon the face of the nation. This is LBC from Global, leading Britain's conversation with James O'Brien. It is four minutes after 11, and I, th I think we may have been overthinking it again. I, I don't know, can you overthink the comments of Danny Dyer on the telly last night? I'm not sure, but it, it's... What he articulated was the almost unanimously held belief that Brexit is going incredibly badly. What I've missed in my analysis this morning is the absolutely um, crystal clear fact that lots of people who voted for it are still pretending it could have gone differently. So that's how he manages to unite us all, isn't it? So people who knew it was always going to be an absolute disaster because it is such a riddle are cheering him from the rafters and wondering why Jeremy Corbyn wasn't the one on the same programme to, to make these points. And people who voted to leave, like Danny Dyer did, acknowledge that it's a complete disaster, but think, that's why he says riddle, thinks perhaps it could have been solved differently. It's an, it's an insoluble riddle. It's a Gordian knot. I've, I've been saying that to you for two years. It's like trying to take the eggs out of a baked cake. But... That is why the two sides can unite on this one, because one side knew it was going to be like this, and one side didn't, and they're furious as well, because it is. Is that it? Is that is that everything? Let's fight. Let's crack. I take a couple more on this. I don't know how long. I do want to talk about the astonishing um, report published yesterday by the Intelligence and Security Committee that essentially um, uh, establishes British involvement in the torture and kidnap of terror suspects. This is in the aftermath of the um, September the 11th attack on the Twin Towers. It's, it's, it's incredibly damning, and I haven't worked out yet what question to ask you because I, I don't think you're going to care. Even with the tribalism of British politics and the fact that this is a Labour government standing accused of um, appalling practices, they're practices that Donald Trump would do before tea time. So if, if we're breaking it down across the binary lines, I don't know quite how this story is going to play out. I, I'm intrigued, actually, because if, if you are a, I mean, a, a extremely right wing, if, if you're one of the people that is now believing lies and, and hoovering up on a daily basis, we had a couple of them in the crowd at the O2 last night. It is astonishing to, to, to see that sort of level of weaponized ignorance, almost a pride in how little they know and, and the, the, the slogans that get screamed and shouted. You're not going to have a problem with the, even though it was a Labour government, they were they were torturing and illegally extraditing Muslims. So presumably you're going to be cool with it, even though it would give you an opportunity ordinarily to have a pop at the Labour Party that you think is. Do you see what I mean? Is it, that's why I think the story isn't getting the traction that it should be getting. I could be wrong. We may do it from a media. Why isn't the story getting the traction that it should be getting? Is it the passage of time or is it something to do with that you can't pick a side? Because if you're on the side of totalitarianism and Islamophobia, you're going to quite quietly approve of what the Labour Party have done. 
I, 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 I think this is disgraceful. I think Jack Straw should be put on trial. But I don't think that's going to be a platform that gets a lot of support. I don't really understand why. Um, seven minutes after 11 is the time. Back to Danny Dyer. That's a phrase I never thought I'd say. I've said it about 10 times already this morning. Harry is in Lakeside. Harry, what would you like to say? Hi, good morning, James. Hello. Uh, first, time, first time caller on your programme. Love your programme. Thank you. Um, just want to say something in defence of uh, David Cameron. Yes. Um, I think he, ha he didn't really have a choice by calling the referendum. He didn't want to call the referendum, uh, but he didn't really have a choice. Had he not called the referendum, he might got ousted by his party and they might, uh, you know, vote someone, uh, a prime minister who will campaign for leave. And then the result won't be 48% and 52% anymore. So it will be something a little bit less yeah, I don't, let's, let's, let's not go too far down the road, because there's a lot to examine there. The, 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 the initial observation is true. There, there was that, was that strange man called. Not, there's, there, I mean, there, there were two Conservative MPs, I mean, almost sort of unbelievably inadequate intellectually. Carswell and Reckless, was it? So uh, two, two, no, he was an MEP. He never, he never oh, defected okay. to UKIP. It, it was, it was when the, um, no, it was, it was Carswell and, and Reckless, Mark Reckless. I think he's yeah. in the Welsh Assembly now. Um, they left the Conservative Party. They, they triggered by-elections and they were elected as, one of them got elected. I don't think Reckless ever actually won an election, but I think Carswell did in the, in the, um, almost exclusively white constituency, white, British constituency of Clacton because everyone there was um, convinced that their lives were rubbish because of immigration that didn't actually exist in that constituency. There's a very good canary down the coal mine for how Brexit would play out. They left mm -hmm. the Conservative Party and Cameron was very worried that others would follow. So that's why right. he did it. If he thought, all right, we'll have the referendum, they won't defect to UKIP and we'll win and then that's put the issue to bed for a generation, which I think works yeah. as a defence of him. That's pragmatic politics, isn't it? But it's also self-preservation. Yeah. True. It's very true. You're right. Um, yeah, UK play a huge part there. I mean, uh, Conservative was really fearful at the time of UK, and that's uh, part of the reason what promoted him. It's the um, reason. It's, I mean, it, that's, 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 that's why it happened. But, I mean, his job was to win elections, and he, he, he did win an election in 20. He then lost the referendum. So I, I, it, it's not as hard to defend him as I thought it would be when you started, actually. Yeah. Um, the other point I would like to make is before the referendum, he went to Brussels and tried to renegotiate a better deal for the for, for the UK. Yes. Um, and one of the things that he wanted desperately is a emergency break on the welfare. Um, but Theresa May and Philip Hammond uh, told um, David Cameron that Germany will oppose that. It's undeliverable. Mm. Uh, and therefore, he's depleted of the cabinet support, and he didn't ask for it. That, that had he, go on. Yeah, yeah. Had he asked for it, uh, the outcome might very well be different. Uh, I'm not sure, but that's you know just a point. He might uh, have got it. Defense. I thought he yeah. did. I mean, the, 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 that was the bit that confused me the most. There were two things I was confused by, uh, and and I'm only now confused by one of them. I, I don't know what he was expecting to get given that we're in neither Schengen nor the Euro. So from the Brussels perspective, we, we kind of already were as close as we were ever going to get to having our cake and eating it. We were out of two of the biggest political um, institutions that the European Union has introduced. Um, it's not necessarily the right thing to do, but if you're trying to keep the Euro sceptics happy, not being in Schengen and not being in the Euro were the two biggest prizes on the table, and they were already in our pocket. So I, I still don't really understand what he was hoping to achieve on that trip. And the second thing I didn't understand is, is what they were actually celebrating. As time passed, some of the key players in the Brexit movement, what are they so happy about as all of the evidence is mounting that they've sold the country apart? But now we know that they made hundreds of millions yeah. of pounds and stand to make hundreds of millions more. Yeah. But I still don't understand the trip, the, 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 the trying to get special concessions. You think if he'd come back with an emergency break on immigration in general, because that was already covered under Article 2 of the Citizens' Charter? Yeah, but the fact is no one, uh, you know, the, the general population didn't really know about it. I think the Remain side really lost the propaganda, uh, prop propaganda? Yeah. propaganda war. Well, yeah. they did. I mean, they turned up with, with a, a battered pair of boxing clubs and an old copy of the Queensbury rules, and when they got there, they found out it was a knife fight. Uh, and that, that is, uh, you know, a, a kind of symptom of the whole, the whole malaise. And also, if you're describing a future that doesn't exist as opposed to a flawed, a deeply flawed present that does exist, 
I think it, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again. You read back over the, the, the two campaigns and how they were run and how truth was debased and how propaganda was weaponized and how uh, sub-Nazi um, imaging and posters, that breaking point poster, straight out of the Joseph Goebbels playbook. It, it, it's a miracle it was 5248. You're looking at the sort of... It's only because we're quite a highly educated population, I think, that so many people could see through it. Uh, Leanne is in Bishop Stortford. Leanne, um, Danny Dyer speaking for The Nation. Did he speak for you? Um, well, I, I am angry with David Cameron, but yes. um, the point that I wanted to make is my husband and I have always said that um, it's going to arrive at this point that um, people who voted leave, I mean, I voted remain, mm. that people would look um, to blame somebody. And they started blaming the EU for not giving us what we've asked for. Yes. Um, and now I, I actually think this is the start of things getting really ugly to be honest with you, because uh, it's, you know, the anger of Danny Dyer um, is showing that he didn't really understand what was going on. Unfortunately, it was up to all of us um, to educate ourselves. I mean, I'm very much like you, James, that um, I didn't know mm, a lot. Didn't know the half uh, of it. At all. To start with, I had to go away and educate myself. I have spoken to before. My husband's Italian, and he knew an awful lot more about the EU. The education um, in other countries... Um, on the EU and the good that it does is um, is far superior to us. I mean, my children at school don't learn anything about the European Union, which I think is disgraceful. Um, but the point now is that they're trying to look for someone to blame. Um, and I just think this is going to get worse and worse. Well, they're bla it's the Remainers the mostly are to blame because we didn't believe hard enough, uh, it seems to be. the uh, We should have got behind it and made it work, um, say all the people who but told us it would be easy. It, so it was never going to work. If you went away and did your homework and you understood how it worked and you understood what we could have already put in place, but the government didn't, which is, I mean, I do blame David Cameron for that. Um, it was, what was it, a smug com complacency, probably the best? I think it's um, not wanting to admit the mistakes that the government have, have made over the years, not putting in place um, immigration controls that they could have done. I mean, I come from a... Fa or, or explaining why they hadn't, rather than pretending that they didn't exist. I mean, this, this I think, is the crux of, of Cameron's betrayal, is he knew that they had the measures in place. They, he knew the European Union accommodated more stringent immigration rules. He also knew that it would be damaging to the country to impose them. But because immigration is such a useful scapegoat, especially when viewed through the lens of the Daily Mail and the Daily Express and all the other cheerleaders, the Sun especially, it's so useful to say, oh, that's because of immigration. Why haven't we got hospitals? Oh, that's because of immigration. Why haven't we got... But I'm paying my taxes. So are the immigrants. So are the migrant workers. So are the... So are the um, are people using freedom of movement. But if you can just let that ship sail, then it lets you off the hook. It lets David Cameron off the hook, just like it let, arguably, let Gordon Brown off the hook before him. If they'd said, well, we could bring in limits, but we're not going to because it would damage the country, they'd be in a very, very, very different place politically. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, the issue as well now across Europe is that there seems to be this confusion. The immigration that they're seeing in Italy and other countries is not the same immigration that, that we're having. The, this massive here. conflation. We think that the European Union is arguing this week about freedom of movement yeah. when they're not. They're talking okay. about non-EU citizens, often but not always fleeing war and, and famine and violence, um, coming into European Union countries. But again, our newspapers have betrayed us on a scale that's almost impossible to believe. There is no debate in yeah. Brussels about freedom of movement between European Union countries. The debate is solely about what to do with non-EU citizens arriving at the shores of Italy. Yeah, but I do think, you know, last night with Danny Dyer, I think the fact that it's gone viral um, just goes to show how angry people are getting now. And that, and, and it's where that anger gets yeah, directed. And, they will want to blame somebody rather than... And if they blame the people that lied to them, that involves admitting that they were lied to and that involves yeah. admitting a degree of gullibility that many people's pride and ego won't allow. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm a little bit more optimistic than you. I, I think this signals a, just a beginning, a softening, if you like, of that level of denial and, and stubbornness. Although I, we, we mentioned Dom Jolly's contribution to the programme a moment ago. I don't, I don't want you to think that you have to be high profile to have your tweets and your texts read out. I read out as many as I can. But Giles Corrin's one of my favourite writers. He writes columns and, and reviews in The Times. 
Um, he says, I like Danny Dyer very much, I love him, but I think his inarticulacy and passion without any sort of direction or solution and the way it has been so celebrated is tragically typical of most Remainers and it's what made us vulnerable to the low cunning of the Leavers. Except that I think Danny Dyer voted to leave and what he articulated wasn't just um, uh, an unhappiness at the way things have gone. I think it was an unhappiness at being invited to vote at all. But, but yeah, there is something in that, that sense of incohate uh, fury. I have to admit.